Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Silicon Global Online Series. Really appreciate you being here today. We've got a great discussion debate for you on US-China tech strategies. And if you haven't joined us before, here's a little bit about who we are, Silicon Dragon Ventures, and what we offer. So take a glance. And now I'm going to go to our wonderful panelists and their books that are um, just out, very recent books. Uh, two of them have grand strategy in them, in the title, uh, China's Grand Strategy and A Grand Strategy and China's Quest for Foreign Technology, uh, also Tech Titans of China. Uh, so uh, it's great to have all these wonderful editors, authors on board here to share their thoughts. And here they are. And you can see them here in the screen as well on the side. Uh, so first we'll be starting with Bill Holstein, a business journalist based in Hong Kong and Beijing, um, is the author most recently of A Grand Strategy, Countering China, Taming Technology and Restoring the Media. And then uh, we have uh, David Danone, who is uh, the director of the China Center at NYU and his new book uh, that's out or co-authored, uh, co-edited book. Uh, um, and then uh, we have Didi Kirsten Tatlow, Senior Fellow, Asia Program, German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin. She's co-editor of China's Quest for Foreign Technology. Uh, so we have um, three great panelists. I'll be moderating. Um, and then I should say that you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, all you need to do is type your question into the Q&A box and I'll be reading those and get to those as we go along. But we are going to be encouraging a lot of debate. It's a very um, hot issue, as you know. And uh, so uh, look, um, here's a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so as you can see, a lot of issues on uh, 5G, semiconductors, uh, cyber hacking, uh, where are we headed? Where's the future? How did you see in Beijing? get along or not get along. Uh, so, uh, Bill, um, I'm going to stop the share here in a minute uh, on the slide and let you uh, take center stage here. Uh, Bill, tell us about um, your thoughts on this topic and uh, what, your, what your view is and um, what, uh, what should be the right strategies. Thank you for this. We've been talking about these issues for 25 years, you and I. So my That's book true. is my book is a, a, a recap of, of the different points of engagement I, I've had over a 40 year period with China, starting from my time in Hong Kong for UPI. And then I was Beijing bureau chief, 1981, 82. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I bought into the vision that many of us had that, that engaging with China and, and, and building them in to the global uh, uh, economic and security system that we had created would work. And that, that it was good for China, good for the United States, good for the world. It was a win-win. But over time, uh, I've uh, I, I have realized that under Xi Jinping in particular, that it's not working out that way. That he is uh, he's become a digital authoritarian, uh, and he has not uh, engaged in the world order that we had created, and, and rather is, is seeking to undercut the institutions that we have, have, have created and create his own world order including military uh, bases outside of China. So, um, so I think that we're in, from, we're in a moment of real reckoning with China because uh, it's not working out the way we thought it should or would. So as part of that, we had a, this idea of globalization that, that it didn't matter where our companies went, where they transferred technology, uh, where they sold, where they manufactured, that it all worked out in the end because they would continually generate Profit and national national security was not uh, on the on the table. It's not an issue, not a consideration. But now we're finding that our companies are in China and are selling high technology goods uh, that are going into weapons and going to space program. And in fact, we, as Lenin said, we're the capitalists are selling the rope with which we'll be hung. So we have a moment of, uh, particularly now in view of, of Xi Jinping's uh, crackdown on his own technology sector. The he has is, he is decided that China's technology sector has to serve the interests of the state and the party. So we have to figure out a way 
to respond. Uh, I think it means that our governments in the West have to uh, cooperate in ways that they had not done before or not done recently. And we have to have a new understanding between our American government and American companies about how they cooperate to establish national security. Our, our IT systems have been deeply penetrated by the Chinese. Microsoft gave the source code for Windows away to the Chinese government starting in 2003. So uh, we, have, we have a real reckoning on our hands and technology is at the heart of it. So with that as introductory comments, I'd like to hear what my other panelists have to say and then we'll mix it up. Sure, well, uh, Bill, it's interesting because uh, you and I, we have had many discussions about whether China tech could get ahead with a kind of a top-down centralized government um framework and so uh so what are your views about that today because i know we've gone back and forth on this issue well you know we debated when you first came out with tech titans i i was sort of dismissive that i i did not think that they could develop the uh entrepreneurial kind of uh infrastructure ecosystem we have here where ideas come out of universities and are, are funded and grow and blossom in company scale. I mean, that's the heart of the American model and, and it can't be dictated by uh, from, from the central government. But the Chinese have done a brilliant job of, of, of embracing many of those elements and, and superimposing centralized state control. They have their Made in China 2025 document. So the government has, has guided a private sector in ways that we, I, I didn't think was possible. I thought China might be trapped in the uh, middle income and, and middle manufacturing position. But so you are, you are more right than I was about their, their emerge, technological emergence. It's, it's absolutely stunning that they're putting uh, vessels on Mars at the same time we are, that they're, they're uh, creating their own uh, global positioning GPS system, that they're, they're, they're a world-class in, in many technologies and may have an advantage over us in certain technologies like 5G. We don't have anything to compete with that. And in AI, as, as Didi will tell you, Microsoft helped them develop the leadership for their AI industry. And in certain areas, they may be ahead of us. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by many things. I'm surprised by the nature of the China that Xi Jinping has created, but I'm also I'm surprised by the sheer level of sophistication that they're showing. Right, so we may have underestimated them. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, David Danoon, uh, your thoughts? Well, um, I agree with the general background that Bill has provided. Uh, let me add a little bit more of context. I think if you look at where China was 42 years ago uh, when Deng Xiaoping started the economic liberalization, uh, China's trade was smaller than Taiwan. Uh, no one thought that China was a challenge, either economically or militarily, to the outside world. It had a large land army. It has 14 countries that neighbor it. Uh, so it, it can move that army around uh, to have any direct effect on those neighbors, as it has recently on India, for example, or Vietnam in 1979. But uh, people didn't see China as an assertive force uh, able to spread its influence and power on a global basis. Um, that began to change, uh, particularly with the financial crisis in the United States in 2008 and 2009, when I think the Chinese realized that in many ways uh, they were stronger than people recognized. Uh, that led uh, a few years later uh, to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which was the first effort really to move Chinese aid on a large scale uh, into Southeast Asia, into Southwest Asia and Africa, and increasingly now in, even into Europe. So China became uh, a competitor, uh, not just of the US, but also of Europe and certainly of Japan in a way that was not anticipated. If you look, for example, at the Rand Corporation's book on China's grand strategy, which I did when I was working on mine, uh, you'll see that Rand did not anticipate that China would be a direct military challenger in any point in the near term future. They saw them as a long term challenger, but not in the short term. So, the kind of things that Bill just mentioned that the West generally felt engagement would encourage China to participate in the Western system um, was a reasonable assumption at the time. Uh, the problem is 
the, the US and many in the West just held on to it too long. Uh, and as Bill has mentioned, uh, because China has had such a rapid improvement in its technological capability, it has the ability to challenge. So the theme of my book on grand, the grand strategy is where the Chinese going. And my basic argument is that they are blocked somewhat uh, on the Pacific side by the US, possibly even in the short run with uh, other countries that are willing to cooperate with Taiwan. So China's main focus on expansion of power, influence, even its economy is in Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia and Pakistan, uh, Middle East and Africa. Uh, and what's interesting is to see uh, how their traditional problems in Northeast Asia are still there. They are not really in good shape uh, with the North Koreans. Uh, there's this ambivalent relationship with Russia and an ambivalent relationship with Japan. So I think during our discussion this morning, uh, we yeah. can uh, go into this in more detail, get a sense of how China is using the technological capability that was mentioned, uh, but also using its financial uh, cloud uh, in a way, again, that wasn't anticipated 10 years ago. Right, so since you're looking at this from a futuristic angle, do you see that there may be two spheres developing of influence of uh, Asia, China in Asia, a US in Western Europe? Uh, do you see that happening? Well, uh, I think it depends which uh, political party wins out in, in the next uh, midterm elections and in the presidential elections in the US. Uh, there's a, a fundamental debate about how uh, overcommitted the US is. I think there's a general feeling that we are overcommitted. Uh, the question is how do we get our allies to carry uh, their part of the load? Uh, and what will those new arrangements look like? And I think uh, President Trump raised a lot of these points, but his manner antagonized enough people that didn't get them resolved. Uh, and the Biden administration's withdrawal from Afghanistan is not reassuring either. Again, we, I think we can talk more about that. But um, the, I think the general dilemma the US faces is that we've been a global power since the 1950s. Uh, so that means that virtually everyone in the foreign policy community today has gotten used to that system. And if we're gonna change it, it's gonna be difficult. Rebecca, to answer your question specifically, uh, yes, it is already starting. The fact that the Chinese government, uh, government is demanding all data in China from private companies be held by the government. The fact that it's saying that the private companies that are trying to list in New York, if they have data intensive uh, uses or uh, uh, businesses, that they can't do that. The Chinese government is pulling down uh, sort of a great wall around Chinese data. So there, there's, that, that is starting already. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a very interesting signal. Yeah, oh, that's true. Um, okay, well, let's bring in a European perspective here with uh, Didi, who's in Berlin. And uh, Didi, uh, please yeah. go ahead. Hi. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon from Berlin. Um, so, yes, I am uh, in Europe. So I'm sitting um, in, you know, the heart of one of those allies that David just referred to, uh, seen as a very reluctant ally sometimes. And definitely Afghanistan has increased distrust of the US, I'm afraid, um, in Germany quite strongly. It's something we're all trying to cope with now. Um, so, you know, to, to get to the tech issue um, specifically, I, I was in China for a long time as a journalist. Um, I've lived in Beijing for 17 years, uh, 14 of them as a journalist, otherwise as a student. And I think um, through all my reporting, um, I really didn't understand as much as I did when I began in 2013 to connect to really wonderful uh, people in the States who are specialists in um, technology transfer. And, you know, just that opened up so many doors and windows for me because it really explained to me what was China actually doing as opposed to what everyone, for example, in America and Europe said China was doing, which was, you know, rising and, you know, becoming just like us, et cetera. Well, frankly, that wasn't happening. And the guys who spotted this the earliest on 
were working to some degree, some of them in the intelligence community, um, not necessarily anymore. And uh, most of their work was open source. So this is very important because 95% of what China is doing to extract technology is taking it from open sources. And you know they built up this huge system to achieve that starting back in 1956 at the very latest when uh, Zhou Enlai, who was the premier of China and also, by the way, China's spy master, this is a very little known fact, um, you know, basically said you have to go off and build a system to extract, te te extract technology from the West, et cetera. And, you know, people basically went and did that. And so I think when we look at China's rise, we in the West, so to speak, um, tend to think of this incredible economic growth and isn't it wonderful, haven't they been amazing? And particularly businesses um, do that. But what we haven't looked at or ever understood and still don't broadly is to what extent that rise was fueled not just by very hard work on the part of Chinese individuals and citizens, but also by this massive amounts of technology that came to China that was extracted by China, taken to China, commercialized and built into real raw economic power. And um, you know, China did that with enormous support from business and businesses, governments and political and um, citizens in, in the developed industrialized nations. Simply China's rise from 1978 would never have happened without that technological support. So now we're, we're facing a very different almost mind-bendingly different situation where you know China's coming back at us in a much more aggressive way. It's turning inward as well as trying to create dependencies amongst us, if you like. It's a kind of a weaponized inward turning. So it's an interesting and very, very difficult moment to try and get people to change their paths, how they deal with China. It's particularly difficult in Europe, I would like to say, um, where there is widespread reluctance to deal with the China challenge has been a little bit of improvement in the last four years, but it's still very, very difficult indeed. So I'll stop with some initial remarks there and give yeah. it back to the floor. Okay, very everyone, everyone. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Didi, tell, Didi, thank tell you. us about the German election and what that implies for Germans' relations with China. I mean, if we yeah. Americans are going to seek to build a, a, co a coalition of allies, uh, what, is the, what does this German election mean? Right, well, so this it's been called um, a Richtungswahl, which means a direction election, which not, rhymes nicely in English. What it means basically is that there's a lot hanging on it, more so than previously, when basically only ever, you know, Chancellor Merkel was re-elected. Now, she's been in power for 16 years, which a lot of people here, frankly, think is too long, and I would agree with them. A lot of things build up in 16 years, um, a lot of things that, uh, some good things, but also some things that you really don't want happening in government. And Germany is really... Uh, due for a big change. Um, so there's a lot of expectation whether that will come. Now, the only real way that it will come with China policy, um, I think, is if the Greens get a substantial role in government. Um, they are by far the most critical of China and Russia. They have these sort of fundamentally almost sort of almost kind of libertarian, but sort of left and very climate oriented leanings. That's very fundamental, I think, to the to the green psychology. Um, Whereas with the CDU and the SPD, so the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats who've been power really for a decade plus, um, we have a very centrist kind of mercantilist attitude. And uh, above all, China and also Russia, I would add, want that attitude to continue in the German government because it's really enabled them very, very far. Uh, they've gotten through Nord Stream 2. Uh, the Russian side is China has had very, very little pushback, very little challenge from the German government in this for, for years now, really, ever since 2007, when Angela Merkel met the Dalai Lama and was uh, really quite punished by Beijing in ways that we probably don't even fully know about, um, and then totally drew back. And, um, you know, I've actually sat next to the kind of Chinese people who are supposed to give messages to the German government and events. And they said, yes, well, she did meet the Dalai Lama in 2007, but then she learned and now she doesn't anymore. So yeah, Europe is, um, we'll see what happens. I mean, overall there is a general shift, but I think nothing near enough um, that will be enough for the United States. Right, so do you see, uh, for all the panelists, do you see the US shifting its own strategy and what should the US strategy, grand strategy from the US be toward China, not only from DC side, but from tech side, Silicon Valley side? 
It's a fascinating moment, Rebecca. Do we have a grand, do we even have a grand strategy toward well, At China? the moment, we do not have a strategy. That, the purpose of my book was to sketch out what that might look like. And the heart of it is the relationship between our government and our major tech companies. Can we establish a, a, a more of a partnership in the sense of protecting our IT systems? Can we establish more of a, uh, of a cooperative, cooperative uh, framework to uh, advance American technologies while uh, going softly, going slowly on semiconductor sales in China, for example. Dave and I wrote a piece for Asia Times in which we suggested that the West should develop a, a, a grand technology strategy aimed aim consciously and specifically at, uh, at uh, blunting China's rapid technological advances. Mm -hmm. But we, we're, not, we're not equipped to do that. We're not, we, we don't agree about that, whether that's even possible. The fascinating moment here in the United States at the moment is that the reason it's fascinating is that business is making a push uh, on the Biden administration to reduce the tariffs that Donald Trump imposed and to uh, make nice and to, to retreat from what appears to be the possibility of a, a comprehensive uh, review and rethinking of what is the American position vis-a-vis -vis China. So it's a fascinating moment because our American businesses don't believe that 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 they they should be part of a response to China. They want to continue business as usual. They want to continue making the money in China. And, and frankly, I think many of them have been intimidated by by Chinese. Uh, Apple, for example, wouldn't dare uh, uh, blink in the wrong direction because its entire supply base and its entire production base is in China. So. The the we I think we now understand what China's strategy is in the world, but the, the, now the challenge is up to us to figure out how to respond. Right. So yeah. So this blueprint for infrastructure and technology build out, um, and uh, yeah, I mean I, that's part of the answer. But also, um, as you say, there's a lot of um, debate about which way we should go with that and what eventually is going to be enacted. So also um, with reshoring. Is reshoring really an option today? Um, you know, we keep talking about reshoring, but you know, it seems to be very. <clears throat> Business has not really embraced it fully, uh, so no, it's not really happening. Well, I, I would David? extend what Bill is saying, and, and argue not only is business not endorsing it, business is, is opposing it and trying to undercut efforts to uh, limit their involvement in China, uh, particularly in the high tech area. I think. For this particular discussion, what's important is that um, I don't think anyone is talking about reducing trade in low-tech or average uh, production uh, items. What we're talking about is uh, reducing the technological sort of content of uh, trade where, where uh, those uh, items have a dual use, where they can be used in both the military and the civilian mm -hmm. areas. And yeah. uh, they are an increasingly um, broad range of subjects. Uh, again, Bill touched on them, but let's just go back through some of them. I mean, artificial intelligence uh, has vast commercial uses. It's already been uh, identified as critical for things like facial recognition, but it can also be used for targeting uh, and for analysis uh, in ways that uh, were simply not feasible 20 years ago. Uh, and the Chinese are definitely are equal in that and possibly ahead in certain ways. The same thing with telecommunication. Uh, Bill mentioned 5G, but it's not just 5G. It's a whole set of other changes in com computation itself. The Chinese are producing high performance computers themselves. Uh, they used to be just importing them, uh, either buying them or importing them and making them uh, to specifications. Now they are making their own advances. So these are areas where uh, when our top high-tech firms uh, function in China, uh, everything that they do is, of course, known to the Chinese. Uh, and we have to make a, a much more fundamental uh, decision of whether we're going to encourage these firms to do that. Uh, it can, there can be changes through tax law and so on, but getting those changes is not easy. Uh, and you would have to have a, a clear consensus in the Congress. You would probably have to have uh, strong 
uh, willingness also on the part of the president as well to press for this. And I don't think I see that now in the current administration. Mm -hmm. Well, is getting a Huawei 5G capability here in the US, is that feasible? Uh, we have the Europeans uh, very strong in this, but the US has been out of it. Well, I wouldn't say the US is out of it. The US provides the chips which enable these machines to work. And without the chips, they can't function. So when the Trump administration took a hard line uh, on uh, Huawei, uh, they actually uh, fundamentally threatened Huawei's uh, financial uh, viability. Uh, and, and that can still be the case. But you have to have a president and a Congress who will do this because obviously business is going to volunteer on its own. Okay, uh, Dee, yeah. do you have anything to add from the- Yeah, I, I was gonna ask Dee, Dee and Dave about an ASML case, the Dutch semiconductor company that makes the extreme, extreme ultraviolet semiconductor machinery that's used to make the, the most advanced three and five nanometer chips. So there was German content in, in these machines and uh, there was Japanese content, there was American content, specialized mm -hmm. mirrors, very specialized machine that the Chinese wanted to buy. And the Americans were able to persuade the Dutch government not to issue an export license for it. Did that, did that anger the, the Germans or did the Germans understand that? Well, I don't think it particularly angered the Germans. I mean, I think that they did understand. I mean, I think that overall, um, I, I think that, you know, Germany is a kind of a special case in that it, it has a huge amount of technology, which is all the time, being extracted, going to China through collaborative research, through companies, um, uh, by multiple means, as the official Chinese phrase is. That's a phrase that was put out by five ministries in 2001. It was essentially a carte blanche to anyone connected to the Chinese state, either as a citizen or as an institution, to locate and extract technology from overseas, however they could. So. Um, that's a really big part of the extraction system. But I think that, you know, um, Germany is now very divided in some ways in that they recognize um, they have their own chip shortages, they need them. Um, and they recognize to some extent, and I think they feel kind of bad about this, that they have not contributed positively towards dealing with the China problem. And frankly, they just don't know how to get out of it. They just don't know. And when you look at these really big companies like Volkswagen or BASF, BASF is um, about to make the largest, well, is making the single largest overseas investment in China in history. And that's its chemical plant down in Zhangjiang in Guangdong province, which is, by the way, the headquarter of the People's Liberation Army, Navy, South China fleet. Um, you know, but they don't know how to get out of it. So what we're hearing in public is that we're in too far, we can't get out of China. But when you actually look at the figures, it's very interesting because Volkswagen, VW, for example, says we sell 40% of our cars in China. Now, this is true as far as it goes. However, you know, they sell cheaper models. They only have a 40% share of the joint venture with their Chinese partner, which is called Volkswagen China. And, and a whole host of other reasons means that they probably make about 20% of their global profits in China, not 40%. So 20% is a lot, but it's not ever as bad, quite as bad as the business establishment in Germany kind of tells us, you know, that the dependencies don't go as far um, and, and as, as they say they do. And the real problem is that people here are afraid to say, well, actually, you know what? China's dependent on us. They're afraid to turn that around and do something about it. And, you know, I, I just think this says something about, you know, the, the kind of the kind of capitalism that we're wrapped up in now. Um, you know, the very, the, the complete focus on the next quarter profit, uh, profit. you know, the, this sort of the Silicon Valley model, which is transnational and not national. And we have all these same problems here in Germany too. And I think, you know, frankly, I think it weakens us greatly. Well, since you um, brought up Wall Street and uh, I'd like to ask um, all the panelists about uh, your view of the uh, new restrictions um, from both sides on listings of uh, Chinese companies. Um, so what did, are there any views you would like to share on that topic? Well, it, I'll, I'll start. Um, the, um, 
the, the, I mentioned earlier the, the, the cleaving of the two universes in data, but there, there also appears to be a, a cleaving of the two universes when it comes to money flows, even though uh, the American financiers have been lured into, uh, into China big time recently. JP Morgan got control of its local affiliates and uh, Ray Dalio made a big investment. So the Chinese are consciously playing the, the money angle on the Biden administration that that if these major major players have investments in China and the Biden administration threatens something that's draconian, then they're going to be able to say, well, we have the systems at risk, the, finan the stability of the financial systems at risk, and you, the American president, are doing it. So, uh, so there, there, it's a very big things are happening in the world of finance. Uh, I think that we are naively walking in. Uh, we're, we're expanding our financial stake in China at the very moment when we should be uh, asking ourselves, how do we want our capital to be used? Well, the, the All of this news, uh, yeah, David, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. David. Okay. Uh, the big news, of course, uh, over the weekend was uh, George Soros uh, criticizing Larry Fink of BlackRock for having mm -hmm. BlackRock uh, go ahead with uh, very substantial new investments in China. Yeah. So Fink is taking an enormous risk given uh, the, the tension in the US-China relations, but also the, this tightening of control uh, that you, uh, Rebecca mentioned uh, about uh, not just listing of companies, but management of companies, their data, their control uh, and the taxation. Uh, this whole new term, common prosperity, uh, it sounds pretty Marxist to us. And certainly in the last 20 years, uh, China has been running away from those kind of terms and that kind of uh, language. Right. So what's your long-term view of China's innovation? It's what we're doing now going to restrict China's innovation. Is what China doing now going to restrict or hinder China's innovation drive? Uh, well, I'm actually working on a project dealing with aspects of that, and uh, we're trying to divide it up into different sectors. So, for example, uh, the Chinese have made all, some really significant innovations in quantum computing. Uh, they have really good high performance computers, uh, which they didn't have 10 years ago, whereas the U.S. has led in this, you know, for the last 50 years. Uh, and so these are big adjustments for the United States. Uh, in terms of other areas, what's interesting is, for example, in financial technology, uh, the reason the Chinese have been able to move ahead is they never had walk-in banking. It, people didn't expect to be catered to. So they were willing uh, to simply use uh, handheld devices uh, to do banking, which uh, Americans have not been comfortable with. And Americans are still uncertain whether that information is going to be protected. In China, nothing is protected. It, nothing you do in the public sphere, at least, uh, is, is not known to the government. So uh, this sense of, of uh, China being able to not only design, but control uh, the public uh, is a, it's a new element for Americans to deal with. Uh, now. Of course, we were familiar with this happening during the Cultural Revolution and so on, but certainly from Deng Xiaoping's uh, liberalization forward, the sense was that China was moving in a more open direction. But that's clearly not true today. Semiconductors, yeah. Rebecca, are the absolute mm -hmm. key. I mean, China buys $300 billion worth of semiconductors every year from the outside world. So that comes from Korea, it comes from Taiwan. TSMC in Taiwan is a major provider of semiconductors on the mainland. Uh, so if we could uh, have a conversation even among these companies and these governments about what is our strategy? Do we have a strategy and what kinds of semiconductors we're gonna to allow to go to China? That would have huge power, huge leverage. But, but imagine the, uh, uh, the difficulty of persuading these companies and these governments to uh, undertake something like this. It would be, it would be uh, I think it would be rational. It would be a, a logical thing to do in, re in, re in response to the surprises emerging from China, but I, I'm not sure it could be done. Yeah, th yeah, this will be a long way from just 
trying or saying you're going to ban TikTok or ban WeChat, right? Right. Yeah, if I can just add to something that David said, you know, I think on the issue of um, um, what the strategy that's come, that's been coming at us for a long time from Beijing, and we just haven't frankly been smart enough to realize. Um, um, I sometimes say that I find people in the West were, um, it's not very polite of me, um, ignorant and arrogant. <laughs> so I'm told, don't, I'm told, don't say arrogant, say complacent. So it's more diplomatic. Um, but I will stick by ignorant, you know, because for long, the longest time, Chinese people have known so much more about us than we have known about them. And, you know, fair play to China. They are um, hungry. You know, they're focused. Um, I, you know, I, I obviously worry about what this means for the world, but, um, but, but, you know, we need to accept that, um, that challenge and that, and we need to know that, but, you know, on the issue of, um, uh, dependency in technology. So quantum technology essentially went to China from, um, Austria, um, from, you know, there was a Chinese scientist called Pan, Pan Tian Yan, who, uh, who, Pan Tian Min, excuse me who uh, worked for a long time in Austria, and they set up the first quantum uh, technology call through space, you know, and the obvious thing about quantum, of course, is that it's related to cryptography, that it creates systems that cannot be cracked. Um, and, you know, this, this sort of cooperation has gone on for the longest time between Chinese scientists and, and in Europe and in, 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 in the United States. And we have really, you know, been so giving, you know, we've really approached China from as if they were a object of development a kind of you know we've been normative you know we've had our universal values and we said well of course they're just like us therefore we're just going to you know treat them like this and develop them and etc this is of course patronizing on one level and you know they've really turned around and and are really showing exactly why that was so patronizing i mean i'm talking here about the communist party not about the people um but to get to the issue of dependency, which is really the core of the problem we have here is all these growing dependencies. You know, last um, October, Xi Jinping was quoted in Tiushi, which is the um, journal of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, as um, saying that we are going to work to increase the outside world's dependency on our industrial supply chains. So that's your first move. The second move then, is this inward turning that some of us have alluded to, like cutting off from the world, uh, all the bands that are coming out and the changes that are coming out for everything from ride hail, you know, ride cab sharing to, to e-commerce to the entertainment industry, just a whole pile of stuff. And when you combine these two, what you get is a kind of a dependency coming from the outside and an inward turning in China. And what that is really is a great pull of power toward Beijing. And, you know, this was then addressed in, by Li Keqiang in his work report, when he talked about the creation, like creating that China wanted to create a, a, a powerful or a strong gravitational field towards which the whole world will be drawn. Now, you know, it's the end game of that, that we can stay out and say, hey, we don't want to do this because we, you know, we think your human rights situation sucks. You have no privacy. And, you know, you ride roughshod over a lot of people. Um, you know, do we do we say that or is the other option going to be somehow this whole process is going to go so far that the tensions in Beijing are going to be so large that the interests will simply explode at some point. And what we will quasi then see is a massive power struggle in China. Where will where will this faction sit? Where will this person sit? What will the military do? You know, that that's kind of another very long term and um, I think, you know, difficult scenario okay. we realize now that that manufacturing itself has strategic power that we outsourced a lot of our factories to asia and to china and mexico but now we're we're discovering that if they dominate the, a particular industry uh, that gives them a kind of strategic power to dictate the terms of the engagement to use these companies and use that market power as as a tool for the government right. and for the communist party so that we we were naive in some ways to allow our, in many ways we were naive in allowing our manufacturing sector to be uh completely outsourced and offshore for example right. we don't make any computers in the united states at all to my knowledge or any consumer electronics at all so we are that's a major vulnerability uh and 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 looking at it today you'd say well why why in god's name would you 
make it, make yourselves that vulnerable. Well, we did it because we were driven by our illusions of of a, of a global economy, globalization. It didn't really matter where things were made, uh, and the global supply chains were were, were all, all, always function smoothly. You just put something on the next FedEx plane, and it'll be here in the morning. So we're we're going to have to rethink many of our fundamental assumptions about how we have conducted ourselves. Right. Mm. Uh, let, okay. Let me Bill's point. Um, I would say the most influential book in international economics in the 1970s was a book by Raymond Vernon called Sovereignty at Bay. And it essentially argued that uh, the nation state wasn't gonna be that important, that international corporations, because of their efficiency, were gonna be moving capital and technology around uh, and that we should quit focusing on the nation state uh, as, as the focus. Uh, that linked up with the liberal political view of, of uh, interdependency and as if uh, all of this was a positive sum game. Uh, I think what Didi has pointed out is that the Chinese never bought that. that they right. never bought it when they were on the left. They, now that they're more on the right, they still haven't bought it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think what's sad is that there is, I think the manufacturing community recognizes the danger they face, that they're gonna lose control of a lot of these key technologies. And, but the financial community and particularly BlackRock being the largest financial uh, sort of aggregator of capital of its type in the, in the US, uh, what was uh, in uh, a situation where um, they are going ahead with funding uh, uh, many of the things that the Chinese are doing uh, with Western capital. And uh, so this is leading many people like myself to say, we've got to have some kind of uh, guidelines. And I think Bill is saying the same thing. The question is, are these going to be voluntary? Are they going to be imposed? What's going to happen? Because uh, there's a definite conflict between what the business community wants for itself uh, and what national security may require. Right. So um, we do have some questions here I'd like to bring in. Uh, so uh, from Sean Connor, uh, he wants us to discuss the 800 pound gorilla in the room, uh, namely the role of AI in the next 10 years as an economic engine and its possible implications. So anyone on the AI question? This is a well, hot um, ticket, certainly. Uh, so, uh, and I take Dave's point that AI is going to have clear military uses. So the question is, can we can we have any kind of pattern of, of joint cooperation and sharing of ideas with the Chinese in AI research, uh, while at the same time sort of uh, drawing a curtain between uh, our work that has military implications? I don't know whether that's possible or not. So much of the AI work is foundational. Once you develop a, an algorithm or a program that can analyze data so quickly, that, that has clear military implications. So I, I think we face major issues and in, in, in do we compete head to head against the Chinese model of AI development? Uh, Sean is someone who knows this very well. They, they have a, a, a dominance over large data sets because there are no privacy provisions in China. So if, if their, their version of AI is based on having machines learn on the basis of large data sets, they're destined to, to triumph. We, we, we ought to shift gears, it seems to me, uh, to develop other models of AI development that where we have an advantage, we have an inherent advantage. So if they're, they're just in AI alone, there are dozens of uh, critically important issues. Right, right. So yeah, uh, uh, yeah I wanted to say, it. yeah, um, you know, China's been incredibly, um, forward looking on the AI issue. And they basically have this thing called China Brain Project 2030, um, which was sort of the whole the whole um, plan, if you like, sort of research industrial plan um, began about 2015, uh, 2015, 2016. And, you know, they're able to marshal such resources so quickly that I think we kind of need to get to the point where we are actually looking at, and this is something very relevant for Europe, where we are looking at um, 
you know, resisting some of these um, enormous claims that are being made upon individuals, upon human beings, if you like, by these AI interests, where we really need to look at privacy as being the issue that can, um, you know, push democratic societies forward in a positive way in order to, you know, deliver the sort of quality of life that we expect, frankly, in, in rule of law societies and that, you know, people by and large don't really expect in China. So I, I do think that that kind of values-based issue is an absolutely crucial one. We're not going to be able to compete with China in numbers. Um, you know, China doesn't just have access to its own um, statistics about its citizens through all these hacks in the U.S., starting with the OPM hack. Um, it has access to huge amounts of data about American citizens too. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. And as for the cooperation, I have to say that um, I think that that's pretty impossible. <laughs> I don't think we can do that. So we're, we're, there's no um, partnerships, uh, no collaboration going forward or very, you don't see that in the future. It's China's, more of an adversarial China's relationship. I mean, China has long, you know, identified the United States as, you know, as an enemy, if you like, as the adversary. We saw that way back in the 1950s when Mao, Mao Zedong was talking about it. That has never changed. People ascribe a lot of things to Xi Jinping, and most of them are, you know, fair. He is definitely having a huge impact on the country. However, in a way, I like to say that if Xi Jinping didn't come along, they would have had to invent him, because in a way, he really sums up a lot of what I think that the party was always all about. Okay. So there was a question about uh, Xi Jinping versus Putin and in, in relation to their power strategy. Uh, so anyone can answer, anyone can find one here. Well, the, the, the Russians and Chinese are finding it mutually convenient and mutually beneficial to make it appear that they're and engaging in a deep pattern of cooperation. But having been based in Beijing and studied this and watched it unfold over a number of year, years, they, there's profound uh, distrust between the Russians and Chinese uh, for many reasons. The, the Russians have, have, have essentially sought to turn China into one of their SSRs and they sought to dominate and control uh, China just as the Chinese believe the Americans are today. So there's just profound, profound distrust between them. And they'll do things that are mutually convenient uh, in terms of hacking our systems and in and, and terms of headline generation. But I don't think that they're going to truly unify uh, their, all their resources in, to create a, an uber uh, uh, socialist uh, superpower. I don't, I don't believe it'll go that far. I think that what they will do, however, I do agree with that, but I think what they will do is uh, join forces to the extent that they can together bring, you know, raise the likelihood of bringing down this great enemy, which is, you know, democracy, et cetera. And we do see that in their strategic partnership, um, you know, that it strengthens them. And I think we are seeing a form of authoritarian learning, if you like, from, from that they're learning from each other where they want to, although I, I do agree it's a transactional relationship. And, you know, that that's, um, something that we feel quite strongly here in Germany, I guess, because um, in the sense that we're really close to Russia and we have, you know, the European Union has countries that are directly threatened uh, militarily by Russia. Um, recently, Lithuania took on, has been taking on China. I mean, it's a, it's a nation of 3 million people and they've been, you know, basically challenging China. And, um, you know, so that raises questions about, about what to do uh, from the European point of view, the European Union, will they support Lithuania or not? And what was interesting was that Chinese state media then came out and said, you know, you tiny Lithuania, how dare you stand up against us massive China? Uh, we will pull together our, you know, friends uh, in Belarus and Russia and, um, you know, sort you out. So there was actually a direct open threat to Lithuania uh, from, from Chinese state media. And it involved China Russia. Chinese cracked down yeah. on its own Chinese tech companies. Um, is that something that's good? Is that over antitrust, over anti-competitive uh, behavior, over uh, becoming too giant, uh, too much power? Uh, we have kind of some of these same issues going on in the U.S. with Silicon Valley and D.C. at odds with one another. So do you think that uh, China is going in the right direction with its crackdown on these Chinese tech titans? 
or is that going to backfire? Or what what's the long term impact? It's going to slow down innovation, make it more difficult for startups. I what just I, I would think that yes. I would think the answer is yes. It's going to in the short term. <clears throat> it's clearly going to to slow the pace of Chinese innovation and, and occurring in the the old private sector. It's going to slow down their ability to attract Western capital. I think Xi Jinping has made a fundamental judgment that that the private sector uh, uh, is going to prove useful to the, the Communist Party. And then now it's time for the Communist Party to draw these companies into its uh, grip and into its into its interests. So I think that there's going to be a, a clear slowdown in the ability of the, these formerly private sector companies to continue to innovate. But it may be that their technology now is going to be absorbed more rapidly by the Communist Party and the army because of the military civilian fusion that Xi Jinping has declared. So uh, it's, I, it's, I think it will slow down the private sector, but maybe within the government and the army that they will actually absorb more technology. Right, okay. So we have uh, some uh, two really burning questions here that I'm seeing on the side and I would like to get those in. Uh, okay, Resoros and Fink. Does Fink just have a huge blind spot does he think that Chinese markets are just markets like any other? Is he part of a huge Western misperception about the true nature of communist China? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, any response from anyone? Yes, I, I strongly agree with that. I think mm -hmm. what particularly Americans uh, have tended to look at China uh, and you can go back to the days of the clipper ships as just an enormous market and, to, and essentially trying to figure out what that market is. Uh, what they haven't realized is that China has other ambitions. Now, I think uh, what's interesting is to see how skillful uh, Chinese diplomacy is. But let's look at South Asia, for example, India, China, <clears throat> uh, relations, uh, China's relations with Pakistan. I mean, China has pledged $60 billion to the China-Pakistan economic partnership. They, they haven't given the money uh, they've just pledged it. So the Pakistanis know that they're there. They're trying to come up with projects to pursue. But in the short run, what the Chinese are doing is, is sort of jousting with the Indians over some you know, desolate uh, sites up in the mountains in the Himalayas uh, between China and India. So they're, they're diverting India's attention away from economic development towards wor worrying about border control. Uh, the, to me, th this is an example of a clever strategy. They're, they're going ahead uh, in, in one sense, threatening India by having a close relationship with Pakistan, but at the same time, causing a nuisance to India on the border. Uh, I think that's a sign of uh, a, a power that wants to project influence and uh, sort of uh, capability in different parts of the world. And they're sort of testing it out. And so uh, if I were in the policy planning staff at uh, Zheng Nanhai, I, I would say uh, this has been a relatively successful effort so far. Now, mm -hmm. we can go and pick other examples where they've been less successful. Uh, in Southeast Asia, I think they have possibly antagonized a number of the countries more than they've gained, uh, particularly uh, their, the hard line that they've taken on the South China Sea. But, uh, I think the, the broader pattern that we're looking at is China experimenting with being a truly global power, not just an Asian power. Okay, there's, all right. Thank you, David. Uh, there's another very provocative uh, point question here um, that I'll bring in. Beijing effectively controls major US CEOs like Tim Cook, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, Etc. Should the U.S. have new laws or rules to force CEOs like Cook to declare themselves foreign agents when they testify before Congress or write articles or make any statements re China? This this is explosive, of course. Uh, President Biden did meet with the CEOs of Microsoft and <clears throat> Google and a couple others uh, about two weeks ago, and he he asked for them to uh, help the government. Uh, with uh, IT security, national security, in effect, he was asking for their help. 
And so they were, they listened politely, but I don't think it's going to change their policies at all. So um, they, the government is going to have to explain that American national security is at stake in terms of, of how our IT systems are performing, in terms of the technology that's flowing into China. And say to, say to the, uh, pick one of these CEOs and say, this is a matter of national security that you cooperate with us and allow us to understand, are the Chinese inside your systems? Uh, are they, are they, wh what, are the, what is the nature of the technology they're uh, extracting from you? And, and it's a matter of national security. Uh, I think if you did that with one company, the others would get, would get the idea that, that uh, the antitrust uh, crackdown is not gonna happen fast enough or it's not gonna be thorough enough to get the job done. I mean, antitrust uh, suits can be tied up for years in courts. That's what Microsoft did in the late 90s. They tied up the uh, antitrust suit from Joel Klein until the George Bush administration took, play, took over. So the antitrust crackdown uh, is, is, is not gonna be powerful enough to discipline the major technology companies. It's gonna have to be, I think, uh, a government, our government saying, this is a matter of national security and, uh, and, that, and all that that implies. The sheer, the sheer for, force of the federal government is gonna come down on you if you don't cooperate with us. So let me just ask, I'm going to uh, dive into our poll here too, and why would I do that? Um, and uh, I'm going to launch the poll with the audience and you can respond here, it's all anonymous, uh, it's multiple choice, uh, and uh, I'll read out the questions. Um, will US-China tech relations improve, uh, yes or no? Um, which country do you believe will gain the advantage in tech innovation, US, China? Uh, what is the future of Chinese tech listings in US? You are listings in US, more listings in US, no more listings in US. Okay, what lies ahead for US, China relations? Peace, stability, Cold War, no change. Um, okay, is China a winner in China crackdown? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, and then uh, just a personal question. When is your next trip to China? <laughs> 2021, 2022, not for a long time. Um, and a few more. <clears throat> Can a state-led economy innovate for the long term? We discussed that. Uh, where are we heading with the coupling of US-China tech? More dependence, less dependence. So people are weighing in here. And uh, we're going to get our percentages in a moment. Uh, so most people think that U.S.-China tech relations will not improve. Um, uh, they believe it's rather split U.S. slightly ahead on which country will gain in tech innovation. Um, most people say that there'll be fewer listings in the U.S. from China. Uh, most people say it's going to be a cold war. A uh, few people say uh, peace and stability, and uh, and some say no change, but the most say Cold War. Um, okay, uh, is Taiwan a winner? 50% uh, no, 33% uh, maybe. Uh, your next trip to China, 61%, uh, 2022, not for a long time, 33%. Can a state-led economy innovate for the long term? Um, more people say yes than no, but it's rather mixed. Um, more dependence uh, is coming in on the decoupling question uh, as the leaning that way. Uh, future of, okay, uh, let's see. Yes, more dependence, fewer listings. Um, there's just a few more questions here. Um, and thank you everyone for participating. Uh, can a state-led economy innovate in the long term? I think we got that one. Um, okay, I think we have all of them. So, yes. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the polling and then share the results with everyone, um, which is always fun. And then, uh, panelists, uh, feel free to discuss any further points that you think we didn't cover. Uh, or that just came up in these uh, results here of the poll. I'd like to ask Dave, what, what, Dave, what do you think about how 
um, American government or Western governments could persuade their companies to shift gears? Well, what do you think it would take? I mean, I, I've suggested a pretty heavy handed approach with a uh, national security approach. Um, what do you think, uh, what, what, kind, what kind of tools do, do the Western governments have? Well, uh, obviously uh, they, the major incentive is tax policy. At the moment, there's still enormous incentives to manufacture overseas, operate overseas. Uh, if those are reduced, and this gets back to Didi's point, uh, if those are reduced, uh, then there'll be some you know, possibility of repatriation of capital and of manufacturing capability. Uh, but without fundamental changes in tax law, I don't see it happening at all. And I, I agree with you about antitrust. Uh, antitrust will be fine for my son uh, and maybe my grandson, but I, it's not going to do much for any of us now. Can I? Yeah, I'd like to add to that, if I may, briefly. Um, antitrust is a fascinating possibility there, which is that if you can trace things back to the Communist Party, whether it's individuals, uh, United Front activities, technology transfer, or companies, or venture capital investments, which are in the United States, if you can connect these to the party, then essentially you can bring in maybe potentially antitrust issues and laws, because when you think about it, in China, that's exactly what's going on, is this absolutely massive monopoly, and it's growing because the party is taking more and more aspects of, of business under its control or, or changing them in ways it, it has to change then, right? Um, and, you know, whether or not China, the, part, the Communist Party and its, its, its organs, its institutions, its state-owned companies, etc., could be identified as a monopolist, to me, this is quite an interesting argument. And a, a possible tool to deal with in the, in the States and in Europe to deal with China, a monopolist power. Okay, I'm afraid we're just about out of time and, all, and uh, it was great hearing all of your viewpoints. <laughs> um, yeah, no, and everybody please run out and uh, buy their books. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're all on Thanks Amazon. For the <laughs> and um, I would give yeah, my so, email, uh, uh, Rebecca, I would give my email if anyone on listening would like to contact me, may I do oh, that? Oh, okay, good. And actually there was a question, David, uh, about the name of that book that you, what was the title of that book you, you suggested? You, oh, what was the, that? the book that I referred to by Raymond Vernon yes. called Sovereignty at Bay. And it came out in the mid 1970s. Sovereignty at okay. Bay, at B-A-Y, meaning uh, sovereignty is losing its power. Okay, good. And my Thank email you. is bholstein2011 at gmail if anyone would like to communicate. Yeah, yeah, let's continue the dialogue here, the debate here. Uh, actually, there's going to be another panel uh, in a week from now uh, on the cyber, uh, cyber capital. Uh, Bob Ackerman uh, is a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley in Washington, DC. And he has a firm, uh, Allegis Cyber Capital. I've known him for a long time. He's going to be on September 15th, 4 p.m. Um, and um, it's on our uh, site. Uh, just uh, go to silicondragonventures.com and check it out and sign up there. Uh, so I appreciate it, everyone signing on. And uh, round of applause for DD and Bill and Thank David. You. And uh, Thank there's you. the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It was fun. Okay. And All very right. interesting. Take care now. I love right. it. Thank, Thank you. you again. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Yes, everyone. We, a lot of good feedback. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. There's the end button. <laughs>